Audio recording for this meeting has begun. All right, we are going to go ahead and get started. Oh, oh, I'm hearing an echo from one of our other presenters, I believe. I think he's muted now. Excellent. Um, so before we get started, I'll just remind our presenters uh, to make sure that you also have um, only one of your speakers open. You may need to mute your computer speakers uh, to avoid any feedback. OK, let's get underway. Hello, everyone. On behalf of AgriLinks, Feed the Future, and the USAID Bureau for Resilience and Food Security, I would like to welcome you to our webinar today on Advancing Country-Led Accountability for Performance in the Ag Sector, Africa's CADF Biennial Review. We'd like to thank everyone for making the effort to join the webinar today, uh, particularly as everyone is adjusting to new arrangements at work and at home due to COVID-19. My name is Julie McCarty, and I am your AgriLinks webinar host with the USAID Bureau for Resilience and Food Security. And before we dive into the content, I'd like to go over just a few items to orient you to the webinar. First, please do use the chat box to introduce yourselves, as many of you have already done. And also use it to ask questions and share resources. We'd love for our webinars to be interactive, so please use the chat box freely. We'll be collecting your questions throughout the webinar. And in some cases, our presenters will try to answer your clarifying questions in the chat box. In other cases, our panel moderator, Robert Uma, will pose your questions during our panel discussion. But responses to all of your questions, uh, whether they were addressed during the webinar or not, will be shared with the participants after this event. You'll see that today's slides are available to download in the box at the bottom of your screen. And we've also got a link to the AgriLinks event page for this webinar and to a very useful CADIP toolkit. So please check those out when you have a moment. And lastly, we are recording this webinar and we'll email you the recording, the transcripts, and some additional resources, such as the answers to the questions, once they are ready, which should be in um, about a week or two. And they'll also be posted on the agrolinks.org website. All right, I am going to get us rolling by going over the objectives and the agenda for this webinar and then introducing our first speaker. So the webinar objectives today are threefold. First, to raise awareness of the biennial review, new data, and the tools and resources available to disseminate and advocate using the new results. Second, to share how a country may use the data to improve their performance and increase the accountability of country-led systems and programs. And thirdly, to lay the foundation for future engagements at the regional level and key initiatives by NSA at the continental level. A brief outline of our agenda today, we'll have some opening words from USAID. We'll give an overview of the biennial review and sharing of 2019 data. We'll hold a panel discussion with some stakeholder representatives moderated by Robert Uma. And we'll pose a question to participants, you all, on use of the biennial review data and then cover what's next and some wrap-up materials. All right, so for our opening remarks, I would like to pass the microphone over to Jim Emke, who is our Senior Food Security and Nutrition Policy Advisor with the USAID Bureau for Resilience and Food Security. So Jim, please take it away. Thank you, Julie. It's a pleasure to be here. I would first like to thank the African Union for its Malabo Declaration, which sets the stage for the biennial review. Malabo Declaration is a recommitment to CADAP, which Julie mentioned, the Comprehensive Africa Agriculture Development Program. And it is a commitment to agriculturally led growth and transformation. And it is a commitment to development in general. And specifically within the Malabo Declaration is a commitment to mutual accountability. This mutual accountability is implemented in the biennial review, the topic for today's webinar. So I would like to thank the African Union for their continental leadership in these areas. I would especially like to thank the African Union's Department of Rural Economy and Agriculture for their leadership in 
in facilitating, in directing, and in helping countries to implement the biennial review. DREA, as it is called, and the biennial review are, in fact, far ahead of the curve on mutual accountability, both globally and across sectors. And I would particularly like to thank the director of DREA, Dr. Godfrey Bahigua, for being here in this seminar. I'd like to take a few minutes to set a broad contextual background for the biennial review. And that broad contextual background is the importance of policy systems in agriculturally led development. So first of all, we all know that countries can't do development without development policy. That's just a fundamental truth. But what does this mean? The people who we are most trying to help with development are the poor, the food insecure, the water insecure, the vulnerable, women and children. In other words, they are people who are marginalized in economic processes, in social processes, and perhaps most importantly, in policy processes. So it is very important that the Malabo Declaration has called out attention to these specific groups and called out attention to enabling policies and investments to help these people. But the second point is that enabling policies come from an underlying policy system. We all know that the policies don't just randomly appear in a gazette, that they come from the policy system, and the policy system then needs to generate policies to help these marginalized groups. Which brings us to the third point, the sustainable changes in, in development policy to enable Malibu Declaration require strengthening of the underlying policy system. It requires better evidence and inclusion of marginalized populations in policy formulation and implementation. It includes better policies, and it includes accountability for inclusion for policies and for policy and investment success. And that accountability, that mutual accountability, is implemented through the biennial review. The biennial review as a mutual accountability process is, in my opinion, the most exciting and highest potential development innovation of the past decade. But realizing that potential will take continued hard work and perseverance this decade. We've already seen some of the effects of that hard work and perseverance. Comparing the inaugural biennial review presented to the African Union Summit in 2018 and the most recent review presented this uh, February to the African Union show a significant difference in terms of the number of indicators of progress towards Malabo commitments that have been collected and an increase in the country ability to report on the larger number of indicators and to do more complete reporting across all indicators. There is also improvement in the quality of the data from the first biennial review to the second biennial review. This willingness to put evidence of progress towards helping the targeted development populations on the table for discussion, that the willingness to make it open and public, the willingness to adjust development policy based on these indicators is a game changer. It's something that we have not had access to in African led development previously, and now we have access to it. That in and of itself is a significant game changer. But we still need to continue our perseverance and our hard work uh, and from DREA, from donors, and most importantly, from all of our African partners in order to fully realize the potential of these indicators, this biennial review, and its influence on policy and investment. Today, we have a fantastic webinar on the Biennial Review, facilitated by the LINK Project, which also partners with the African Union, and with various countries on facilitation and support for the Biennial Review process. Julie, I'd like to turn it back to you to get started with the, the Biennial Review discussion. Great. Thank you so much, Jim. All right, before we dive into the discussion, we wanted to bring up just a little poll uh, to get a bit more of a sense of how familiar all of you are with the Biennial Review. Oops, and here, I'll bring it right up here on top of the presentation. So please let us know if you are very familiar 
somewhat familiar, not very familiar, or if you really don't have any idea what this is and just decided to join the webinar today to find out. So we'll leave that up for just a moment. All right, I can see the responses streaming in. It looks like at least two-thirds have some familiarity with the biannual review. Um, about a fifth of you all are very familiar, and uh, about a quarter are somewhat familiar. And But a good chunk are, uh, are at a more base level um, in terms of familiarity with this process. So great, this is very helpful to us just to get an idea of what level um, we should be bringing information to you on. Okay, I will go ahead and close this poll. And uh, so next for our main presentation, I would like to introduce Godfrey Bahigua, who is Director of Rural Economy and Agriculture with the African Union Commission. And I would like to just remind all of our participants that you are invited to uh, enter any of your questions in the chat box at any time. And we'll be sure to try and answer them as possible throughout this webinar. And uh, it would also be helpful to us if you would indicate your country once again uh, when you are asking a question, especially if it is relevant to your question. All right, I will go ahead and pass the microphone over to Godfrey. Thank you. Thank you, Judy, uh, for moderating this uh, webinar. Uh, thank you, Jim, for the introduction, uh, introductory remarks you have given. But most importantly, thank you um, to the participants uh, to this webinar. It is you that make it uh, happen and exciting. So as introduced, my name is Godfrey Bahigua the Director of the Department of Economy and Agriculture at the AU Commission, based in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. So from the quick poll that was done, um, about 55% of the participants are either unfamiliar with or slightly familiar with the CADA binary review. So I'll try as much as possible to bring everybody on board but without getting into too much detail so that we can use the time um, uh, allocated to uh, the webinar. As uh, Jim did mention, the Comprehensive Africa Agriculture Development Program, popularly known as CADAP, uh, is Africa's overarching policy framework to drive agricultural transformation on the continent. With many objectives and goals, but the overarching objective is to reduce poverty on the continent and increase food security and nutrition of the African population. The CADAP biannual review process comes out of the desire by African leaders to hold themselves accountable to the outcome of the investments they make in the agriculture sector. The Comprehensive Africa Agriculture Development Program was uh, adopted first about 17 years ago in 2003 in Maputo. Mozambique, and after 10 years of its implementation, the heads of state reviewed the progress that they had made and still believed that agriculture was an important sector for transformation of the majority of African economies. And as a result, they recommitted themselves in 2014 through what is now popularly known as the CADAP Malabo Declaration. This declaration is more detailed 
than the Malabo, than the Maputo Declaration, with the more specific goals and targets by heads of state. And as the Jim did mention, one of the commitments that the heads of state made in 2014 was commitment to mutual accountability, to hold themselves accountable to the, to the investment actions and results, and they called on the African Union Commission together with the NEPAD agency, which is now known as the AU Development Agency, to produce a report every two years, beginning in 2017, to be presented to the AU Assembly, showing um, the progress that the member states are making towards the implementation of the Malabo Declaration. So what you are seeing on the screen um, is basically the timeline that we are following to produce a report, the Banyo Review Report, every two years to, that we present to the Assembly. So the first report, as Jim mentioned, was presented to the Assembly in January 2018, and the second report was presented in February. 2018, just last month, and both reports were adopted by heads of state. So the next report is due to the Assembly in 2022, and the others will be 2024, and the final one will be in January or February 2026. The Malabo Declaration has given transformational goals or commitment, and these do not exist in isolation. They are linked to both the UN Sustainable Development Goals and specific goal number two on ending hunger to achieve food security and improve nutrition and promoting sustainable agriculture, and also linked to Africa's own Agenda 2063 which has seven aspirations, and the work of the Marabo Declaration contributes to aspiration number one, which is about a prosperous Africa based on inclusive growth and sustainable development. So in other words, the implementation of the Marabo Declaration does contribute to the achievement of Africa's development aspirations, as well as the achievement of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, briefly here we show you the, the seven Malabo commitments, ranging from the recommitment to the CADA process from 2003 Maputo uh, to 2014 in Malabo, and the five substantive um, commitments cover enhancing investment in financing agriculture, commitment to ending hunger by 2025, uh, reducing poverty through agriculture by half by 2025, boosting into Africa trade in agricultural commodities and services, enhancing resilience of both livelihoods and production systems to climate variability and other shop, and then the seventh one, which is the basis for this presentation, is strengthening mutual accountability to action and results. So those are the seven Malabo commitments that are the basis for assessing the performance of AU member states. Now, the bio review process endeavors or is an evidence-based uh, process where we bring out to our member states their performance across the seven commitments or thematic areas with performance categories and ultimately indicators. 
Now, what you are seeing on the screen, basically, is the summary of what of the process in 2017, which was the first report, and 2019 for the second um, the annual review report. So the themes are the same, seven themes or seven commitments. In the first annual review report, we had 43 indicators. But after the reviewing those indicators, we saw some uh, critical indicators were missing. And so in the 2019 report, we have 47 indicators from 43 to 47. Of course, the, the themes remain the same. I will not spend much time on this slide, but just tell you that we go through a very rigorous process that involves mobilizing our member states, training um, our country teams, and providing technical backstopping to, uh, to our member states, to holding validation workshops at country and regional level, having a right shop and reviewing the report all the way to taking the report to the assembly. So it is a very rigorous process. And as you can see uh, on the slide, basically it took us a year from the first meeting we had in Kigali in February 2019 to when we presented the report to the assembly uh, in February 2020. So basically 12 months of dedicated and intense work that was conducted by the AU Commission together with the NEPAD agency and different partners that I'll mention later. Now, as I indicated in the, in the previous slide, um, for the two periods of reporting, um, in the first report we had 47 of the 55 AU member states participate in the, in the review, which was very encouraging, because being the first exercise, and you have 47 out of 55 member states participating, this to us showed the commitment that AU member states have in their own uh, process that they established. And we were further encouraged that in the second biannual review report in 2019, we had 49 out of the 55 member states reporting. So basically, only six member states did not report. So we remain encouraged and we believe that uh, by the time we are in 2025, all the 55 member states will be on board and will be reporting. That is our ambition, to leave no country behind in this uh, review process. Now, to help you understand the findings of the Banyo Review Report, um, just have some terminologies for you to appreciate um, the data that, or the results that I'll be showing you in the next few slides. For each period, well, first of all, the, the Banyo Re Review process covers the entire Malabo uh, period, which is 2015 to 2025. So in trying to assess progress that member states are making every three years, we have to have milestones, we have to have benchmarks. In other words, we have to have a score that a country must attain every three years for it to be on track towards meeting the Malab Declaration. And we call that a benchmark. So for the First report in 2017, for a country to be on track, they had to score 3.94 out of 10 for them to be on track. In 2019, that benchmark is, was 6.66 out of 10. So any country that scored 6.66 or higher was on track. And any country that was that scored less than 6.66 was not on track. And so 
every two years the, the benchmark is different, but ultimately it will be 10 in the last report that we shall present in 2026. So for 2021, we already know the, the benchmark, it is going to be 7.66. So basically, in short, it is the minimum score that a country must attain for it to be on track towards achieving uh, the Malabar Declaration at that point of assessment. And so what now you are seeing on the screen are the results from the 2019 uh, assessment. Uh, like I said, the, a country, for a country to be on track, the benchmark was 6.6. .6. So any country that scored less than 6.66 .6 is in red. So you see the numbers in the main square. So any country that is, has a score less than the benchmark is not on track. And so for 2019, we had four countries. Only four countries were on track towards achieving the Malabo Declaration. Uh, with Rwanda being the number one country, uh, followed by Morocco, Mali, and Ghana. So those were the four countries whose scores were either equal to or higher than 6.66, .66, which is the benchmark. Now, as much as many countries are not on track, we are encouraged that the majority of countries actually made positive progress between the two assessment periods. In other words, between 2017 and 2019, we saw 36 countries made positive progress. And those are the numbers that you are seeing to the right of the, of the individual scores. You see them with an upward arrow and in, in green, that is the percentage increase of the score for that member state between 2017 and 2019. And so, even though many countries are not on track, the majority of countries who are at 60 number made the positive progress. So for us, we are encouraged by this uh, commitment by our member states to um, continue making investments and policy choices that keep their scores rising. It's also important to note that of all the countries that, that were not on track in 2017, only one country, Ghana, emerged from that pool to be on track in 2019. It was the only country that was not on track in 2017, but went on track in 2019. And I think in this, um, in this webinar, we'll be wanting to hear from our colleagues from Ghana what it is that they, need, they did uh, differently that uh, brought them to be on track while others uh, were not able to do it, and what can we learn from Ghana. I think it will be interesting to hear from our colleagues about that. Now, like I said, uh, for Africa as a whole, the continent is not on track towards meeting the CADAP Malabo goals. However, like I have stated, 36 of our member states made progress. And we believe if they continue um, on a positive trend, perhaps by the time we are in the fourth report, maybe the majority of the countries will be back on track towards meeting the, the Malabo goals um, and target. Uh, this slide uh, basically shows you the trajectory that we shall be following or what the member states will be following towards um, the ultimate year, which is 2025. And what I just described in words you can see now, graphically, uh, you see a positive trend of the scores for all the countries. 
and on average for Africa as a whole, the percentage increase between the 2017 and 2019 score for the whole continent was 12%. Uh, uh, of course, this varies from one country to the other. But overall, like we said, we are encouraged by the positive uh, trend in improvement of the scores of most or the majority of the member states. Now here, I would like to take you through um, the progress that the continent has made across each of the seven Malabo commitments. Um, just remind you, commitment number one is the commitment to the CADA process. And in the first round in 2017, we had 42 member states that reported on track. In 2019, only two member states were on track. Only two member states were on track. So which means that there are some processes in the commitment the CADAP process that a lot of member states were not able to achieve by 2019 and yet they had been expected to have completed them uh, by that period of assessment. On commitment number two, which is the uh, commitment to increasing investment finance in agriculture, in the first round in 2017, only three member states were on track, and in 2019, none of the AU member states was on track. This is a cause for concern because we would like to ensure that our member states are increasing their commitment and investment in agriculture. And this is one of the commitments where we saw a decrease in the overall score. Whereas across the other commitments we saw while not on track for many of them, but at least there was positive progress, an increase in the score. But for financing agriculture, we saw a decline of the score. Again, this is a, a, a huge concern, and this should stimulate debate across the board, from regional economic communities to our member states, but also our partners on what can be done to reverse this trend and recommit to increasing financing to agriculture, both by the public sector as well as the, the private sector. On commitment number three, which is about ending hunger, again we see um, as much as there is some improvement in the overall score a lot of countries in Africa, the majority of countries, are not on track towards attaining ending hunger by 2020. Only one country, and I think that is Uganda, was on track in 2019. And this, this result is also consistent with other findings or other data from the World Bank, from FAO, that have shown a decline in performance on hunger indicators on the continent. Again, this is another concern that we need to double our effort, effort if we are going to fight hunger on the continent and reduce the number of millions of Africans that are hungry, that are malnourished, that are stunted. On commitment number four, which is about eradicating poverty, in this case, halving poverty by 2025 through agriculture investment, in the first round in 2017, we had 28 member states that were on track. That number 
also declined. Now, in 2019, we had only nine member states that were on track and were largely in the West African region. And again, we saw overall a decline in the overall score on this theme between the two periods, a significant decline of 32% of the, the score across the continent. And this is also something to, to worry about. It means uh, member states um, reduced effort in their efforts to fight poverty through agriculture. On commitment number five, which is about boosting intra-Africa trade in agricultural commodities, we see um, encouraging results, which is good news for the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement that was uh, adopted by member states and will become operational from the 1st of July this year. So we see a lot of, commit, a lot of countries are committed to, toward uh, especially creating an enabling environment for agricultural trade to take place. As much as we observe that the volume of trade is not increasing at the rate that we wanted, which is tripling into Africa trade, but we see a lot of countries committed towards creating a neighboring environment, removing trade barriers, and putting in place facilitating mechanisms across borders to improve trade. So this is good news that a lot of our countries are creating a, an enabling environment, and we believe that in the coming rounds of assessment, we hope to see the benefits of this environment through the improved uh, volume of trade across our countries and across our region. On commitment number six, which is about building uh, resilience to climate variability, uh, this is an area where um, we saw overall progress. There was an improvement between the two assessment periods of 19%. And we also saw an increase in the number of member states that were on track from 7 in 2017 to 11 member states in 2019. So this is an encouraging uh, trend that member states are making investments and policy choices that can bring about um, improved resilience at household level as well as overall and especially um, allocating specific resources that are geared toward um, climate change, but also uh, safety net uh, for vulnerable uh, people within the, the country. On the last commitment, which is about which accountability towards actions and results, which is the best of the, of the Banyan Review, again we see uh, an overall improvement in the score across the, the continent. Uh, even though we see um, less numbers, less, less member states that are on track between the two assessment periods, 2017-2019. So what we see from this slide, still um, a lot of countries are committed to towards mutual accountability, but not as strong as they they did in 2017, because now we have only 13 countries that are on track towards the, um, achieving that, uh, that commitment. So what do we learn from, from this um, uh, 2019 report, and what are the calls for action? As I have indicated throughout my presentation, where I observed where countries are making progress and where they are not, and the different actions countries may want to take, we pick out four, four key messages or actions that we believe countries 
should undertake learning out of this uh, second annual review report. So the first one is the integration of the Malabo commitment into the National Agriculture Investment Plan. Unless member states domesticate these Malabo commitments into National Agriculture Investment Plan, so that when you go to a country and you see their investment plan, you can actually see all the seven commitments reflected. Unless that happens, we think it will be a challenge for member states to attain the Malabo commitment because it is from their investment plan that then the, the budget, the annual implementation budget, are devoked. So if they are not reflected in the investment plan, it means they cannot be budgeted for, and that means they cannot be implemented. So it's very important that the investment plans are revised, updated, or formulated to reflect the Malabo commitment in them. Two, that we need to build the capacity for evidence-based agriculture policy making by ensuring that this cadre review review is part of the domestic environment. It is domesticated at country level, not just for countries to be able to report to the African Union about the progress that they are making, but for that to be an internal tool for governments to review the progress they are making and make adjustments that are necessary for them to perform better in the agriculture sector. And that can only happen if the process is domesticated both at the national and regional level. And number three, given the results that I indicated that only one member state was on track towards ending hunger, it means member states need to prioritize policy choices as well as investments that will increase performance across this thematic area in order to reduce wasting, stunting, and malnourishment within their population. And this is an important call because we see hunger rising on the continent. That is a phenomenon that we had forgotten 20 years ago, but it is coming back and should be a point of concern for everybody. So prioritizing investment that will lead ending hunger on the continent is going to be important. The fourth message is about building resilience of Africa's food system that are threatened by climate change, which you all observe. They are threatened by emerging pests and diseases. In the last two years, we have been battling the fall armyworm, and just, and we hadn't even won that battle. Now we have the Eastern African re region invaded by the desert locusts, and we don't know what is going to come next year and the year after in terms of pests and diseases. So, Building resilience of Africa's food system to climate change and emerging or associated pests and diseases is going to be quite important. So there are many messages and recommendations one can pick from the, the findings of the report, but we thought that these four are key uh, towards making an investment that will reverse the poor performance that we saw for many of the indicators in 2019. Finally, my last slide, we as, at the African Commission, together with the, the NEPAD agency, would like as much as possible to have the results of the Banyo review utilized broadly across the board by our member states, by regional economic communities, continental organizations as well as our global partners to have focused discussions on what member states can do to improve their performance within their culture sector. The report is quite detailed. It shows the performance of each of the member states across the seven themes so you can have 
bilateral discussions with our member states on what they can do based on the performance across the seven thematic areas. Now, to be able to have that conversation and it, for it to be fruitful, we want to use different communication tools. Um, and one such a communication tool is the CADAP Banyol Review Toolkit. We have developed two communication tools. One is called the, the CADAP Dashboard, and the other one is the CADAP Toolkit. The dashboard is not presented here, but it is a tool that we, are, we have developed and is under uh, further development and discussion. Um, when we presented this report to the, to the ministers in October, we also presented both these tools, the CADAP Banyol Review Dashboard as well as the CADAP uh, Toolkit. We were advised by the ministers that we need to undertake further consultation at regional level for the constituencies or the stakeholders to understand these tools um, as communication tools for them to have buy-in and pronounce themselves if these tools are useful for what we do. So the CADAP toolkit has been developed. It's an online tool where you can go and find all the data that have, have been uh, have presented. You can select indicators um, and compare them across regions. You can compare them at continental level. You can compare them within country. It's a quite a, a, a rich tool and we invite you to access it. At the bottom, you can see the, the link. Um, you can go and, and play with it, and we'll be happy to get your feedback on uh, what you think about this toolkit. But like I said, both uh, toolkit, the dashboard, and this toolkit will be subjected to regional consultation over the next couple of months. We had wanted to start now, but because of the coronavirus, we can't do it. But we believe um, maybe in the six, uh, by the end of the second or third quarter, we we'll have had these regional consultations and these communications too. So with that, I would like to bring my presentation to an end and look forward to uh, interacting with you through uh, questions and comments. I hand over up to the moderator. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Godfrey. Really a wonderful presentation. Um, and thank you to our participants. We've had, um, oh, sorry, we're getting a bit of an echo, so just a reminder to the uh, uh, presenters to please mute, just in case. Oh, yeah, there we go. That's better. Um, again, thank you so much to Godfrey, and thank you to our participants. I've been so impressed with the questions that have come in. We've been collecting all of them. And uh, thank you to our presenters also for answering as many questions as you could in the chat box. Um, so please do continue to enter your questions. And just in case anyone had their presentation on full screen and can't figure out how to get it back so that you can view the chat box, if you hover over the main presentation pod, you will see four little arrows in the top right corner that point inwards. And if you click on uh, those four arrows, it should bring you back to the main webinar view so that you can engage in the chat box. All right, we are ready to move on to the next segment of our webinar, which is a panel discussion moderated by Robert Uma, who is the Regional Director with Policy Link. And Robert, you have a tough job because there have been so many excellent questions coming in. Uh, but please do take it away. Thank you very much, uh, Julie, and uh, very warm greeting from Nairobi. Uh, I'm really happy to see many friends and colleagues um, from across Africa and beyond with whom we've been in the trenches trying to uh, work on different aspects of African agricultural development. Uh, and, and particularly so because this is a really interesting and important topic for all of us. And uh, I really look forward to, to the engagement. Um, so we we have a, a, a great panel with us today. Robert, I'm so sorry to interrupt you. I just want to say you sound a little bit loud, like you're a little close to the mic, and so I was hoping you could 
maybe try backing off just a little bit and see if that helps. Okay. Is that, is that better, Judy? Um, I think so, but I will let you know. Okay. Thank you. All right, so I, was, uh, I want to introduce uh, what I consider to be a great panel of uh, individuals drawn from Africa who have been involved in the biennial review and in CADAP work largely uh, over the past few years. And they each have different but important perspectives on, on how this has developed. And I'm glad there's uh, so many different questions and interests on, on, on this topic, and hopefully we can cover some of them. Uh, in a short discussion. Um, so we have with us uh, someone from the Nancy Acta Fraternity Conference of the International Project uh, Manager for Public Finance for Agriculture from Action Aid International. Uh, and Constance has been working quite uh, extensively in organizing Nancy Acta to engage in agriculture and thinking about the different ways and processes. And I did see some questions that I think Content will be only too happy to, to address relating to how you get civil society uh, involved and engaged in some of these processes. Um, but we do also have someone from a, what we generally refer to as regional economic community, uh, and this is Mane Elho, where is who is from IGAD. IGAD is the Intergovernmental Authority on Development, and uh, Mane is uh, the program manager for food. Security. He also doubles as the had a focal person. Um, Money has been coordinating, in fact, over the past two biennial reviews, not just IGAD, but East African Community and COMES, a group of, uh, I think, 13 countries. Uh, their engagement, their response, their validation, and different processes. So, really look forward to hearing from Money in, in a few minutes um, what his perspectives are. Uh, and then, of course, we have two ladies from Ghana. Ghana is one of the countries that did particularly well in this round of the annual review. And, and with us is uh, Angela Marty Danson, the Director of Policy Planning, Monitoring and Evaluation, Director of the Ministry of Food and Agriculture in Ghana. Um, and along with her is uh, Justine Ivy Quadrain. Uh, who's the deputy director, but also head of the policy planning and analysis division um, in, that, in that same directorate. Um, so welcome. And uh, in, in addition, of course, we still have Dr. Bahigwa Godfrey, who was introduced earlier. Um, so we're just going to go through a couple of the questions that have come up. But to start us off, I'll post some questions to my panelists. And I'd like to start with, uh, with, with Ghana. Because, you know, the BR process really um, happens, the, the, the rubber hits the road at country level, and some might even say at sub-national level. So it may be interesting to hear from Angela and Justin a little bit of their perspective, and then move on up. And I'll start by asking you, uh, Angela and Justin, to share with us what your experience has been collecting data, particularly. Uh, for this biennial review, the cut up biennial review that Dr. Bahigwa just shared with us. And in particular, just the process of ensuring the integrity of that data, uh, its accuracy, completeness. Um, you, you may unmute your microphone and then speak up. Angela? Yes, good afternoon to you all. We as the introduction has already been done, I'm here with Josephine, and uh, we want to use the opportunity to thank the AUC and the whole binary review process. Uh, and it is a good instrument for keeping countries on their toes and ensuring that we live up to these commitments. So we are very happy that we progress from non being, non on, uh, being not on track to being on track with a, a good performance today. So we want to thank the whole team that has been involved in this process. And our minister is very excited about it, uh, as we reported to him uh, just uh, that was on Monday about the performance of the country. Uh, with that, I want to turn to Josephine to take the uh, first uh, question about our perspectives and how we have improved our performance 
in the 2019 review since she was uh, handling and coordinating that whole exercise. And I'll come in again uh, to answer some of the response, the policy that uh, strategies we put in place uh, to improve uh, the aquaculture sector performance. Thank you. But just a finish. Okay. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, as indicated, um, Ghana did very well, and we are here to share our experience. But then, first of all, in trying to come up with our experience with the data collection process, what we did in 2019, I would like to step back to look at some of the challenges we faced in 2017, which helped us to come up with some action for this improvement. In 2017, our experience was that there were some of the indicators that we didn't have any data on at all. Looking at our system, data collection system, some of the indicators we really didn't have any data on. So that was a wake-up call for us. Then secondly, there were some of the indicators that we did have data, but they were not current data, because there were some mandated institutions who um, um, brought up these, um, who had reports on such data, but then these were done regularly, maybe every five years, and therefore at the time of reporting, we didn't have up-to-date data, and we had to rely on progress and all that for the data. So that also was something that we took into consideration. Then we also realized that um, because of time constraints and then the limited resources, we did not engage our stakeholders from the onset. We only brought them on board at the time of the validation. Upon hindsight, we felt that was something that shouldn't have happened, and therefore we put in place measures to be able to address this. So with that background, I'll move to what we did in the 2019 reporting to improve upon our data collection and then reporting. First of all, we took the DR process as one of our core activities, and therefore, um, put in place some resources, both human and financial resources, were allocated for this process. Um, we had a core group who, who were assigned to lead the process. And in doing so, they came up with a multi-stakeholder committee, which comprised of civil society organizations, representatives from the private sector, from academia, and then relevant government institutions. And this committee, was given the responsibility for the data collection and then reporting. So after the training by AU in Accra on the BR template for the core group, when the core group came back, they called the meeting of this stakeholder committee, which we have constituted locally, to also brief them or train them on the BR template because it was going to be a collective work and they needed to have that understanding. So that is the first action we took with the multi-stakeholder committee. Then based on that understanding, we identified all the data requirements and then the sources of such data. Some were primary data, some were secondary, and we also identified the institutions where we could get such data from. And then we assigned, from there we assigned members of the committee to the different indicators to come up with the data that was required, to gather the data. Intermittently, we met as a team to sort of um, validate or do an internal cleaning of data that was gathered. Those that were using proxies, we all came to an agreement which kind of proxies to use. So that was also some of the internal cleaning methods we did to ensure that the data was accurate. Then after that, after putting together all the data by the committee, we had a national validation workshop where we called a number of stakeholders, about 100 stakeholders, to come and then also present to them, for them also to share their views and then give us input into what we had prepared. And then based on that validation, we incorporated the comments and um, inputted online. Apart from that, uh, we also took the step of incorporating the BR commitments into our NAIP. So our NAIP recognized all the seven commitments, and then interventions were put in place to be able to address this 
um, the uh, commitment. Secondly, we also revised our, revised our MAE plan accordingly to ensure that all these indicators are part of our MAE plan and therefore when we monitor, we come up with some data and then information about these indicators. At that same time, we were also coincidentally we were having our agricultural council and therefore we took it upon ourselves to look at all the indicators and then identify those that we don't normally collect data on to incorporate into the census. And so some of the data that we were not able to collect in has been incorporated into the agricultural census and then we are still collecting data on that. So that is um, going to be mainstream so that um, in future we would have data on that. One other area that we also considered was to initiate studies because some of the um, indicators required studies to be able to come up with uh, um, the information. So we initiated studies like the post harvest study because the post harvest was one of the areas where we didn't have up-to-date um, data to be able to incorporate into the report. So we also initiated studies to come up with um, indicators for some of these um, commitments. So in a nutshell, these are some of the actions that we have in place to be able to come up with credible data to enhance our performance. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much, Justin. That's very interesting. And, and, and the reason why I let you go on for a bit longer than I would have otherwise is because I think countries that are listening might be able to glean from what you say just how important it is to prioritize the data collection process and have a, a buy-in, you know, you mentioned a lot of interesting things like forming a committee uh, and, and all the other things that you say, and, and that is, is really, really critical. Uh, and I, I think that Gopi will agree with me that even from the African Union perspective, such a process is what is required, including the validation. Now, one, one other curiosity, and I'll give you guys maybe a minute or two to quickly respond to this, Ghana did really well. In fact, Ghana was uh, recognized for, for moving from not being on track in the previous biennial review to being on track in this biennial review. What specific one or two or three things can you point to that your country did that might have influenced this, this statistic? Uh, because the statistics must, must be there for a reason. Are there some policy changes or other programmatic interventions? Is there any uh, for both of you, uh, Angela and Justin, that you, you can mention really quick. Thank you very much, Robert. Uh, as you may be aware, uh, since 2017, there have been some intense activities in the agricultural sector, with the launching of a, a flagship program called the Planting for Food and Jobs. And this program was launched to address productivity, low productivity in the agricultural sector. As uh, you may be aware, that most of our crops were doing less than 50% of the potential yields that were expected. And so the drive was to ensure that uh, we boosted the uh, uh, productivity of major commodities. And that brought about the support uh, to small farmers with uh, subsidized fertilizers and seeds, which are complementary uh, whatever inputs that are required to boost productivity. And so that was the major, major program that we launched. And alongside with it was uh, extension services that needed to be improved, which is also complementary to increasing productivity. And the marketing, a major uh, national, uh, well, state, state uh, cooperation called NAFCO, National Buffer Stock, was revamped to be able to mop up the increased productivity of production that was expected from small farmers. So that was the first one that was launched. And of course, it was supposed to also create jobs. And so we targeted a few farmers because there is a huge budgetary for education. So we targeted 200,000 beneficiaries uh, in the first year, 2017, and then this to 500,000 in 2018. In 2019, we targeted 1 million. And all these, in all these three cases, we exceeded the target. Able to meet all the farmer demands. So that is the major program that we have now. But as our minister keeps on saying, it's, it's a branch. We're trying to branch agriculture in order to 
to, to really engender this uh, cultural transformation that we need to do to be able to address hunger, to be able to address incomes, and to, uh, able, uh, to be able to address poverty. And so it came along with uh, uh, four more modules, which are all aimed at increasing productivity of uh, crops that we have potential, increasing markets, creating jobs, and what have you. So the second one that was launched was planting for export in rural development. And this was to target three crops where it will bring about diversification in crops and also diversification of income because you have small farmers that will now go into tree crop production. And so we targeted about six to seven tree crops that uh, we, we, uh, various local governments are encouraged to, to do the seedlings and then distribute to farmers, small farmers, to get into this. And that's been estimated. If we, if we develop these three crops, six tree crops uh, effectively, uh, in, in terms of their peak, we should be doing, they should be doing as well as cocoa is doing, and it should be raking in about $2 billion uh, of, 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 of export earnings in order to boost the economy. The other one we, we launched was the livestock sector, because there we also have a, a potential. And most of the programs we've been implementing have been targeting the top stock sector. And this time, we launched the, the, the livestock uh, development module called Rearing for Food and Jobs. And this is targeted at boosting poultry because we have a, a comparative advantage of competitiveness in, in doing uh, chicken uh, if we really invest in it massively right from the entire value chain from the old chain to processing and what have you. So this program is also to enable us to uh, boost the uh, livestock production in order to reduce the meat impulse that we have. The other area that we also did is the greenhouse technology. Where we, we it, it's a train this thing, we are building capacity of the youth to go into this production, and we also uh, provide an opportunity for commercial farmers to take up uh, greenhouse production so that we can improve uh, vegetable production. Yeah, I'm to interrupt you. Yeah. Yes, I, I, I'm, I'm really glad. I just wanted to get a gist of it, and thanks so much. It seems like, I mean, the broader point that we need to make here is that Ghana did implement a lot of uh, policies, and this have shown in the data. And, and uh, I mean, I just, you know, felt the passion in, in your voice and in what you're saying, and I hope everybody else feels that, because that's really interesting. And I, if we have some more time, I may come back to you, but I'm now running short of time, and I'd like to bring Monaim in on this. Monaim, uh, we are running short of time, so I'll give you just a, a minute or so to tell me where you come into this whole structure because you you work for a regional economic community. What your what's your role? What what role do you play? Because this data is collected at country level, either in the data collection or uh, subsequently the the changes that countries need to implement to achieve CADA. Okay. Uh, good afternoon from my end here and thanks for the uh, the presenters, AUC, AgriLink, and uh, Robert, and uh, the, the, the nice ladies from Ghana. Uh, first of all, uh, my name is Mona Malhawaris. I'm the program manager of food security, kind of focal person at the Intergovernmental Authority and Development, IGAD. I've been involved with this kind of story since 2014, when I joined the IGAD team to be responsible for the CADAP implementation in our region uh, during the CADAP PP in uh, Durban in South Africa. That's the 10th CADAP PP. Okay, uh, I've been involved with the, with the, with the, with the AUC, with uh, Nepal Auda, uh, in the process of the CADAP implementation since then. Let me tell you briefly about how we do that. Okay, we've been, okay, as you see that, and then you know that uh, AUC and NEPAD have asked the RECs to join with them hands to implement the BR process. And uh, at, um, at the focal person of uh, EGA, kind of focal person, I've been invited to his other RECs focal persons to the Africa Union headquarters in Addis Ababa. That was, I guess, in January 2015. Where? we agreed on the process of implementing it. First of all, we agreed on the time frame of how we are going to implement the first inaugural uh, process, which was the 2017, that was presented in January 2018. 
and uh, we talked about how we got to be done. First of all, we needed to strengthen the capacities of the member states on the process where we have uh, decided that every member state of the 55 countries of the African Union has to bring three individuals. One is the kind of focal person, the second is an statistician, and the third is an, a planner or economist. And that was done during that year where we brought all the countries in the, in the, in the continent. So for our part, we found that we are having three different tracks that is COMESA, EAC, and ECAD. They're having less uh, members, like, not like the ECOWAS. ECOWAS has 15 members. So we decided that we are going to divide the, 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 mem the continent into regions rather into RECs. So we were called the Eastern Africa region, where we're having 13 countries. That belongs not only to EGAD, belongs to EGAD, EAC, and COMESA. So the three of us, the three focal persons of COMESA, EGAD, and EAC are coordinated together. And to my honor that I was the repartor of, the, of the, the process. So we brought the countries to Arusha. Uh, I was, uh, I can guess it was March 2017 for a training on how are we they, are they going to use the BR indicator. At that time, as Dr. Godfrey was mentioning, it was seven categories, uh, seven indicators, 23 categories, and 43 indicators. So we brought the people and we taught them how to fill the forms. And uh, at that time, it was it was it was not uh, as we call it now EBR because that's one the, the new one in the 2019. So and then we follow up with uh, backstopping to all member states about how are they doing it and we've been working with them uh, hand in hand to implement the process. Money, I'll give you another minute. Money, I'll give you another minute. If you could just summarize that process, yes. Okay. Yes, I'm just telling about the first process. But there is no difference between the, the first process of 2017 and 2019 where we had uh, okay. introduced what we call the EBR. And that made a difference, a big difference that we don't have to be all the time in phone calls, emails. We we share an, an, uh, a virtual uh, data from each country. So the member states they send their uh, their their BR to us, the regional uh, uh, Eastern Africa region, the 13 countries, and we ourselves, the, the three uh, focal person, we divided the country among us and then we dealt with each uh, country. For myself, I was dealing with four countries, and then I was uh, going back and forth with member states, lacking data here, data is missing here, and uh, strengthening this thing. Till we have, uh, what do you call it, uh, a little bit of confidence that the information... Thank you, thank you, Mark. So we get the gist that you you play this role of helping to coordinate the data collection and its quality amongst the countries you are responsible for, and that role is also reprised by the other regional economic communities. If we have time, we'll come back to talk a bit more about some of those elements. But for now, I'd like to bring uh, Constance into the conversation. And as I mentioned earlier, Constance is uh, coming to us from Nancy's actor. And Constance, uh, well, mentioning a little bit about the role of uh, of non-state actors in in this whole process, um, could you tell us also, you know, whether you feel you are properly engaged and your views are included, and and how you coordinate as non-state actors to to make sure that this report reflects the reality in terms of your your role in the entire process. We do have a time constraint, so you will have to be really fast. Okay, thank you, Robert. Uh, thanks, everyone. My name is Constance. I'm calling in from Nigeria. Um, I'll go straight to the question you asked. Um, listening to Godfrey make that elaborate presentation and also the um, great lessons from Ghana and the contribution of IGAD, yes, the missing link is non state actors. We have a role, a major role to play, and when you look at some of the questions popping up on the 
tax box, you could see people raising questions on how we've been able to include all, all players, especially the farmers themselves. Yeah, as non state actors uh, for this 2019 uh, BL, uh, we would say to an extent, yes, um, the process has been a bit better than how it was in 2017. We've been able to, um, you know, organize, mobilize, and make our input into the process. Um, because uh, when we started, when the BL started, uh, we commended the efforts of the AUC and the rest and the member states to implement the biannual review. But we felt that the strategy and procedure was not taking into account the role of all other stakeholders to ensure effective engagement and participation. So basically, we felt as non-state actors, we had and being a major actor in the CADIP ecosystem, we had to strategically define a framework we can use to engage the process. And so what we did was to sit with other organizations and using the, the platform of the CADIP non-state actors, the CNC, um, we came together and, and, and developed what we call the uh, non-state actors biannual review toolkit, popularly known now as the VAP kit. That is the value addition biannual review toolkit. The, the major aim of this toolkit was basically to provide a platform for tracking implementation of the commitments, labor commitments by non-state actors, smallholder farmers, and citizens in general, and then also increasing our understanding and awareness and the consciousness among smallholder farmers and farmer organizations, citizens group, in monitoring these processes at the different levels, starting from the local level to the continental. Then, how do we go about strengthening the analytical skills, monitoring and tracking capacity of smallholder farmers, farmer organizations, other citizens to effectively engage in the whole process? And most especially, determine how well the CADIP resource framework and the declarations capture women's right to food, their resilience, and involvement in the agricultural processes. So what did we do? We came up with a, with a uh, we had a consultative meeting where we brought uh, different stakeholders within the non-state actors platform in 2017 after the KDPP in Uganda. We, we, we generated um, input on how to go about it. We decided that it would be good to set up a toolkit just focusing on some key indicators we felt were very more important to the farmers. Not that all the other ones were not important, but we felt if we wanted to start something, we could start more and expand it. Then we tried to mop up and come up with different tools, different methodologies that have been tried and tested within communities. Take for instance, how do you expect a smallholder farmer group within a community to be able to showcase the stories behind the numbers the national governments are going to be sharing. You've increased financing for agriculture. As a woman farmer, what is the impact on my life? Have I increased my livelihood? Am I having rights to food? So we felt we needed to have stories to those numbers. We tried to develop uh, the toolkit. We tested it, run through uh, different trainings. And then, due to time constraints and due to resources, we were only able to in Petron, this toolkit in three countries. We did that in Nigeria, we did that in Tanzania, we did that in Kenya. And I can tell you, the way we did those processes, it gave us the leverage and opportunity to get into the government processes, for instance, to make sure that we were part of the um, validation workshop, data generating workshop, consultations. And then we were able to present our own um, views about some of the data that were being generated. And the women farmers were able to also point out the gap, because the point of the whole BR is not just to showcase data, submit reports, have good results or bad results, but the idea is how are we committed to ensuring that we are developing African agriculture by putting investment, making sure we are having all the right and the environment to promote people's right to food, to promote people's right to dignity of life, having empowered livelihood, and then making the process very participatory. We try to achieve that. We will not say it's Uhuru yet, but I think it was a better process. We were also ha we have had opportunity to engage with the regional economy communities like the ECOWAS, like the EAC, who had the role to, uh, to coordinate the member countries. And then AUC is not left out. They had already opened that space, they recognized the CNC, and we are part of the um, AU Biannual Review Comms and Advocacy Group, which gave us opportunity to make input into those processes. But going forward, the results have been released. Yes, most countries are not on track. 
but majority have shown progress because we've been engaging, we've been asking questions, we've been asking countries, how do you integrate Malabo declarations into your national agri investment plan? Because without that, you will not achieve the Malabo. And going forward, we are not going to rest. We are taking the results, sensitizing our stakeholders, going to make sure that the recommendations and the gaps that have been found out in the different country reports are closed and the recommendation implemented so that we have better results. I know Robert is signaling me, but, but thank you. I wish to I, I take more time to for me to come here. Constance, that's a good note because you're 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 making a forward-looking statement that you know the result is out. So what? And uh, you 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 make a great point that uh, civil society and non-state actors now need to be part of holding uh, government and other players to account in terms of implementing the recommendation. Now, I want to come to Godfrey in a moment, but before I do so, and the, and the conversation continues because we've got lots and lots of questions, and it does seem like time will be, will be our constraint here, but uh, I'll come to you in a moment, Godfrey, and, and then open it up in terms of uh, fielding some of the questions that have come from the audience. Uh, before I do that, I just want to show uh, everyone a few uh, slide that you can you can use to get to the toolkit and to look at the data. We have put a link on the link pod to the CADAP Biennial Review uh, Communications Toolkit that uh, contains all the data and the graphics and the information that Godfrey presented. It's on the AU website. Uh, you'll see right now on the screen how you can access it. Uh, the URL is there and the link is on the, the link pod. Um, it, it is very rich. Uh, it includes uh, a lot of information, details on the data, uh, what the countries have presented, uh, and it's presented in different ways. You can get the scorecard, you can look at the data by commitment, you can compare countries and compare regions, you can look at all the scores, and we, we, we do have, at the very end, a page that includes uh, downloadable information, including country-level scorecards and the entire toolkit that you can make presentations wherever you go and have people engage on this. And there is something else that's interesting uh, called the Compendium on Malabo Domestication, the Knowledge Compendium, and some information on what uh, non-state actors are doing that uh, Constance has referred to, known as the NSA Value Added BR Toolkit. So that's how you can access data. Um, I'd love for the conversation to go, but I want to, uh, first of all, ask a question that will, will, will come later uh, to Godfrey. And Godfrey, the question is, uh, what happens uh, now going forward? We, we have collected information, we have got uh, the data, we have got the reports, the recommendation, it's all out there. What does the African Union uh, recommend, think, expect that will happen as we go along? Um, Godfrey? And as Godfrey, we have a series of questions that we are asking you. Which are Yeah, thanks, Robert. So, um, and again, uh, I can see lots of questions, and we may not get into all of them, uh, but specifically to you as Robert. So there are several things that the um, African Union Commission, together with the EU Development Agency and REC, uh, plan to do between now and the next report. Uh, so to, stand at, to start at the end, the next report, which is the third Kadab uh, Annual Review Report, will be presented to the ministers in October 2021. Um, so for the remainder of 2020, uh, basically we want to increase the popularization of the report at a different level, continental, regional, and national level, uh, through uh, 
uh, improving or strengthening our communication platform. And that's why I mentioned in my uh, presentation that we have these two key communication tools that were presented to our ministers and they asked us to go throughout the continent, in the five regions of the continent, to consult on this. So we believe that through those consultations, we shall be popularizing and presenting the uh, results of the 2019 report. So that is one key thing that we want to do in 2020. The second thing that we have traditionally done is hold uh, a review workshop with our CADAP banyo review experts on the continent to look at the process we undertook for the second report, what successes we registered, what challenges we registered, so that we can prepare them better for the third, for the third report. We believe that through annual reviews of what we have done, we can be able to improve the quality of the subsequent report that we are going to, to do. Third, uh, we, are, we annually we hold what is called the, the CADAP Partnership Platform. Uh, it is a platform that brings together CADAP stakeholders uh, uh, um, on the continent, across the, the five member states, but also our partners on the continent and globally. So we plan to use that platform um, tentatively scheduled for for the first week of June in Cairo. Um, we shall use that platform to also present the, the results to that constituency. We shall also use other platforms that are available on the continent, like the um, uh, Africa Green Revolution Forum in September, the one uh, organized by Agra. We can also use that to, uh, to popularize the report. And then finally, towards the end of the year, having gone through these principles of, of um, uh, 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 communication, advocacy, as well as review, we our ambition is by the end of 2020 to have trained the regional and country team to prepare for the, the, the collection of data for the third report. We want by the first quarter of 2021 to have started data collection for the third report and also um, have the report this time much earlier, like August of 2021, have the third report ready so that we can prepare better and in good time for the ministerial in October 2021. My final comment is, at the end of all this, what we want to happen is for the results of the Banyo Review Report to be used by regional economic communities for planning, review, and dialogue by, for our member states to use the results to, to reflect on um, uh, their choices of investment as well as policy for our development partners to use these results to enter into dialogue with regional economic communities and member states to align their investment to the priorities that are revealed by the, the Kada Banyo Review results because it's only by doing that that we can actually bring about a difference in the transformation journey of Africa's agriculture. Back to you, Robert. Thank you. Thank you very much, Godfrey. I know that we have come to the end of the time that we had, and it's really unfortunate because we did have lots of questions to, to respond to. And I would suggest that um, we, we are going to stay on for a few more minutes, not more than 10. So those who are able to stay on, you're welcome to stay. Uh, but as we discuss and try to address at least a few of these questions with, with the panel, um, I, would, I would request those who are on to indicate to us in the chat box, based on, on what you've had so far, how might you use the biennial review data? Uh, in whatever capacity uh, you, you, you are working in or uh, how would you suggest that the biennial review data is used. Um, so I'll, I'll switch up back to some of the questions that were raised. And, uh, you know, earlier on, as Godfrey was making his presentation, 
some questions came up, including on uh, on how we how do we ensure that uh, that data is is is, is uh, accurate and clean. But importantly, which of these commitments, the seven commitments, Godfrey, and this question came from Indra Klein, uh, which of these seven commitments is the most challenging to to measure and meet standards? Uh, I guess, Godfrey, you could make a quick comment on that, and maybe I will ask uh, Angela or Josephine to, to tell us what they think as well, in just half a, half a minute or less, maybe 15 seconds. Godfrey? Yes. Um, well, generally, each of the, of the commitment has some element that is challenging, but I, I think overall, if I were to make a judgment, it is the commitment on building resilience to uh, household and production systems because a lot of the indicators um, that are there uh, were new. Uh, measuring re resilience has been or is a new phenomenon at country level and so member states were not very familiar but also the, you find across uh, member states there are many interventions which build resilience consciously or unconsciously. And so when you ask member states to collect data on specific budgets that are allocated to resilience, it becomes a challenge. So I think constantly that is one of the areas we need to be um, reviewing to see how better we can capture uh, the data for the, the I mean, the, the investments countries are making in different areas but are helping to, to build resilience even though within the national budget you may not find the word resilience written against those budget lines. So that is, I would say that is the, really the most challenging um, uh, commitment that we find in, in, in measuring in the review process. Thank you. And, and uh, I'd like to give you a chance, you know, for another 15 seconds, uh, Jospin and Angela. Um, at, at country level, you know, uh, the, we had this, this broad question, and I know Anthem was also asked it. Um, how, how can a country actually use data to improve their performance? Um, sometimes it sounds almost obvious that that, that is something that should happen. But I would, I would love to hear your perspective on it, having had the first round and then used the data in the in the in the second uh, in the second round, and then your performance has changed. Um, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, I think that um, with the data, it helps us to um, identify where we are doing well and where we are not. So with the areas where we are doing well, it helps us to upskill. But then with the others, it helps us to uh, know that no, this is an area where we are not doing well. And then also helps us to put in place the right measures uh, uh, um, to address them. Then the data also helps us to know that the disaggregation of the data helps us to know that there are certain areas that we are not paying much attention. Because most of the um, indicators, the scores came up with a number of variables. So you notice that you have um, data for two variables, but the other one you don't have much data on it. So it also sort of helps us to identify the areas where we need to play, um, put more attention to. So that is what I'll say for now. Yes, thank you so much, madam. And I think Monim also, uh, you, you, you work at a data level in, in many ways, and you look at this thing almost macro. Just in a few seconds as well, how, how do you see data changing what countries and even RECs are doing? What's the mechanism? Morning. Well, there might be a challenge with morning audio. Okay. Yeah. Robert. Yes. 
Yes, I, I, I want to just shed light on, the, on this data issue and the statistics. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Yes, yes I can yes. hear you. Okay. What the, the, one of the problems that we faced in, during the 2017 data collection of the renewable and the 2019 is that the data is not available, especially for the uh, post harvest laws and uh, what do you call it, uh, social protection and th these things in, in regards to the uh, commitment number two and number three. But during the 2019, we have done something that made it a little bit difficult for the member states to, to, to get the data when we added a column asking about the sort of data, which in my view is very important because you might just bring data that is not being sorted out and that people are not going to be confident on whether it is right or wrong. But towards that thing, and the data has to be regular, uh, correct and, 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 and trust, trustworthy, I think we need to strengthen the data collection in the member states, helping them how to, uh, to bring in data. Uh, Ghana saying that they had the data, but they were not using it. But how can we do that okay. and bring that data to be used in a proper way. Great point, Monim. If there are any development partners and other agencies thinking how might we support this, this process, I think helping countries to build their data system and abilities is, is one great way to do it. And then uh, that data can then be used to make decisions. I'd like to squeeze in one last question, uh, and this has to do with the civil society and non-state act actor engagement, non state actor engagement. And this is important because sometimes in these processes driven by government or, or by public sector, uh, some folks think that there is no uh, role and place for civil society. And I'm interested in the feedback mechanisms. If you go all the way down to to the smallholder farmer level, uh, at, a, at a country level, and this, I think Stephen Walsh asked this, and even uh, Indra Klein asked about the partnership and, and so on. And I want to come to you, uh, uh, Constant, to make the first quick remark on this. Exactly how do you get a farmer to be part of the accountability mechanism right down in the village? Uh, from your point of view, Yeah, thank you, Robert. Um, uh, within the non-state actors grouping and um, mechanism, we we have that space where the farmers are part of this, the civil society organizations, the private sector, different groups. So for the farmers, for instance, um, we mobilize and help them be in groups of cooperatives, and then these are cut into organizations. And they have their 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 leadership, who are also representing them in some of these uh, forums. So for instance, during the um, country level validations that were held. Um, the non-state actors group, different organizations like mine and other organizations supported the participation of small other farmers in these spaces. We also ensured that they have space within the working group, within the joint sector review committees, so that they're able to have their space and then speak for themselves. And then we ensure that they attend events where, where necessary. But the idea is that the government should also make it a point of duty to create that space, that status quo opportunity and space for them to get involved. So that even when organizations cannot afford to support them to come to these meetings, they are able to. So they are majorly organized and mobilized, and capacities are built, information are being shared, so they are able to use this and then engage. So for instance, the, the report that is out now, there is concerted effort to work as a group to ensure there is sensitization, workshop, webinars at the different levels so that we can generate the feedback on how the BR has impacted on their life and moving forward, what will be the way forward to ensure that the issues of women are captured in the whole process. Thank you very much, Constance. Um, there are so many questions here that would be interesting to pursue, and one of the lessons that I am personally learning is this topic needs 
like three or four webinars for us to even uh, scratch the surface in terms of some are really deep questions around the data collection and the calculations around it, some sector-specific questions, some process questions, some way forward questions, some partnership questions, quality of data, mutual accountability, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but it all goes to show that we are on to something that's potentially useful, something that uh, could help transform uh, African agriculture, and transformation is becoming even increasingly important in this uh, scenario where we have pestilence like COVID. And, and someone actually did ask that question, uh, what, how BR can help us with the COVID situation, especially since food security is going to be a challenge. Um, we've run out of time, unfortunately, but uh, I would like to uh, thank everybody and particularly ask that if you do have any questions or comments, you can send those to my email, robert underscore .com, and we are going to think carefully about uh, potentially other, other sessions, uh, webinars focused on specific aspects of this, so that we dig deeper and try to answer every question. With that, I'm going to hand over back uh, to Julie. Um, and thank you very much for joining. Thank you, Robert. And thank you to all of our participants uh, for your really wonderful engagement in the session today. We're going to go ahead and wrap up, but we hope to see you at future AgriLinks webinars. And we hope that you all uh, stay safe in um, these unusual times. And uh, thank you all very much. We'll talk to you soon. <laughs>